So there's some questions from, from um, some of our viewers. Um, William Holstein is asking, of all you panelists, where are all three of you based? How did you get permission from top producers to devote so much time and resources to this project? Um, and how long did it take you to do the reporting? Um, he has another question, but I'm, if maybe you could just give us a sense of where you all are and, and how, how you indeed got to do, uh, spend so much time on a, on a story that was really not something that would have been on most people's radar, I would, I would suggest. Joe, do you want to start? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so I'm, well, I'm based in New York. I, if you don't mind, I'll just say like, Julie and I are both ba based in New York and we work in the same office. And then Hind is based in um, the London Bureau. And so for when we deployed, when the field teams went, Julio and another DP from New York went to Uganda along with Hind and another DP from London. So it was nice, we kind of had the two meet. Um, for the amount of time, it, I mean, it, it really took um, the initial investigation and all the phone calls and all the production work that it took to set, set all these elements up. I think actually four months um, and it was a huge amount of time and it actually it's interesting because at times I felt a little bit embarrassed like um you know our our bosses had you know they expected us to be delivering some kind of package that had not been delivered and you know the story was greenlit but the amount of work that went into actually getting it off the ground was like enormous um so I think there were times that you know it felt we needed to rush it or it felt that we needed to wait for the right time and um and I think you know half of it was it was possible to spend that much time, I think, because we sort of trusted that it was worth waiting for the right access. Um, and also because we had other things going um, in the background. So um, I know all three of us were delivering other stories and, and working on other things with this sort of simmering in the background the whole time. Well, you know, I have to say kudos to even to your bosses, just that they gave you the leeway to do this because, you know, with news budgets under so much pressure these days, the very idea of sending a, a, a crew to Uganda to do a story um, that's that people hadn't heard of. I mean, that's great, and you produce the goods. It's fantastic. But um, the other part of his question was, um, did your piece have any policy impact either on the ground or among the NGOs? And that's a big question. Um, and I don't know who wants to take it on, Julia or Joe or Hin. But uh, it is a big. You know, you 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 you've done this story now. Has it had any impact? Julia, I was going to say maybe you should answer this one too. Um, well, I, I mean, I guess we, we sort of touched on it in the discussion about the final scene of the piece in that we were hoping for a tangible result of Mboise being fired and that didn't happen. Um, I think this piece came about in a climate where there has been a little bit more attention on this industry, like Joe mentioned at the beginning, building on some reporting that um, a local reporter has done on how these orphanages feed into illegal adoptions. Um, and so the government has, there was a new law passed a couple of years ago in Uganda to better regulate orphanages. And the raid we, we tried to follow came out of that. Um, we didn't have, you know, a direct policy impact as in from, because of our piece, the government said they're doing something differently. Uh, but our hope is that it's contributing to this discussion and body of work about the problems with an industry like this. Um, and then, you know, on the, on the other hand, I, I hope that anyone who sees this just thinks a little harder about um, the types of charities they volunteer with or donate to, um, the best thing would be to come out of it for me is that if, you know, Westerners who watch this and we're thinking about going to donate um, or volunteer in developing countries took a second look and did a lot more research before, before doing so. Can I thought you say that, Chris. Um, oh, yeah. you can come in, but there, there's another question relevant to this, which is from T. Ferguson, who said, are the Western charities connected to these orphanages, and the orphanages are in inverted commas, um, are they charities that we would recognize, or are they obscure fly-by-night ones, which is to, speaks to what you're just saying, Julia. Um, Joe, do you want to talk to that? Um, the, the, these charities, are they unknown charities, or do we know who they are? 
Yeah, actually, it's, I'm glad that that's a really good question because that's exactly what I wanted to kind of add to what Julie was saying as well. Um, so these organizations, there's a lot of ways that they work. Um, some of them are just, you know, it's a, it's a Ugandan organization that is donated to by foreigners and by individuals or churches. Um, some of them are Western organizations that set up or partner with a Ugandan charity. So it might be, um, it's quite common for an, an American NGO to, to be based somewhere in Louisiana or somewhere in, you know, Houston. Um, and for them to just have another organization that they've partnered with and helped to incorporate and you know, they think that the paperwork's in order and they just funnel money essentially from donors that they are in connection with. Um, and then some of these organizations are just Western run. Like there are really, really big international NGOs that are based in Uganda. And it, it's interesting because typically the really large international groups, um, I like hate to, I, I hate to, I mean, I don't want to necessarily name names, but there are certain really big international orphanages that are based all over the world that have headquarters in Uganda. Um, and those are typically the orphanages that are registered or are sort of um, legally operating. Um, and I think that it was interesting because a lot of the people we spoke to had similar complaints or had similar you know, doubts about most of the organizations that were operating in Uganda. But um, I have a feeling that because of the size of, and scale of those kinds of operations, they were getting, um, you know, they were able to get sort of um, legitimized. And so I'm, I don't know, you know, it's interesting. I would be interested to talk more with some of like local, you know, sort of philanthropists that are based in Uganda about, or Ugandan philanthropists about if they think that, you know, there's any kind of different treatment of when foreigners come and bring some kind of aid organization versus when locals are trying to set something up. So I wonder in your reporting, um, Julia and Hind on the ground, did you visit any of these um, better known or branded orphanages? Were there orphanages that you felt were being run responsibly and you know, looking after the kids and giving them the education that they, they needed? Uh, or were you sort of suspicious of all the orphanages that you were exposed to? We did go to one place um, that was, I mean, they called themselves a boarding school, but they were also getting Western donations and they they had people that they had children that would stay over but their argument were, was that the children would go home during term time um, and so therefore it was a boarding school and not an orphanage but i think that was just a technicality in order to get around the law as well and the reality is we have we don't actually know if that place was legal or you know illegal we, we tried to dig around but from what we saw um it certainly looked like the children were treated well they had a uniform there were classrooms with a lot of art in there and um, they seemed to be a lot happier and a big they had a big playground and they were fed better um, and so we you know we did see that there were places like that that did have backing and um, western backing but also i guess the key issue is, is one of the people that donated they actually traveled to uganda um, a couple of times a year to to see it but then also we don't know what happens when she's not there or, you know, when our cameras aren't rolling. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that there are some places that will give children a, a better quality education. Uh, but also this place in particular that I'm talking about, um, some of the children who can afford it will pay. And so that is used to subsidize the children that can't afford it. Uh, but then there are so many more that are just off the grid that you might just find a Facebook page with, you know, 10 members, but they've actually got lots of children in the orphanage. And, and like what we found when we were on the ground is that there are, there are just so many of them that you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to find a website for, or you wouldn't be able to find um, any details about that exist. And just to add to that, I think, um, you know, obviously, there are hundreds of orphanages that are registered in addition to the hundreds that are not in Uganda. Um, but as we, as we witnessed, corruption is rampant there as it is in, you know, most countries. Um, and so we came away at the end with the sense that even the registered orphanages might not be doing, you know, the best for these children. And, and an aspect of this report that we, weren't able to go into as much as we had hoped is the kind of psychological impact on children 
who are in orphanages, especially when people cycle through, volunteers cycle through to visit, which happens at registered orphanages as well as unregistered ones. Um, you know, so I think the unregistered orphanages are particularly pernicious for obvious reasons, but the whole ecosystem, I mean, the country is just so full of orphanages and putting children who have parents in institutions, that is this, you know, that's a system that seems like it doesn't benefit, doesn't give a net benefit. Um, yeah. And just to pick up from that, going back to the first conversation that we had about that orphanage that we walked into um, with the, 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 the man who, the Canadian man who was working there, the interaction of the children with us, with the foreigners who walked in, they would try and hold our hands. They were trying to hug us. It, it, it was like they had been taught to do that or that's what they were used to doing when they'd see foreigners. The way that they performed for us, it, it was disturbing. Um, and as Julie was saying, there is clearly like a huge psychological impact of children being put in these vulnerable situations with people who just aren't qualified. And you know, people who come thinking that they're doing something that, that's helping children. It's happening not just in Uganda and in other places. And yeah, it's something that we spoke about a lot and we, we definitely wish we could have covered that more. So I can see, uh, I have another question in the chat room from Kimberly Nielsen, but I wonder, Chad, do you have anyone waiting who wants to ask a question um, live in, in the, uh, amongst our participants? Uh, I do not have anyone uh, asking, asking to be on okay. microphone. Well, yeah. If anyone has a question they want to ask you, please, please, uh, um, raise your hand. But um, I have one more question here from Kimberly Nielsen. It's a good one. Um, she says, is there any chance that, that uh, you guys could now do a piece about the US charities? Um, in other words, the other side of the story. Um, Actually, do, do you mind? I, I want to say a couple of things to this. Um, so, so first of all, um, one impact that we had, this is kind of going back to the, the various impacts we had after the story came out. One of the biggest impacts is that the majority of the missionary groups and different, you know, U.S.-based charities that I was talking to in advance for the shoot um, seem to have stopped answering my messages. So I don't know exactly what. Funny you know, that. <laughs> yeah. So I think that it's possible that we've burned a few bridges um, just based on what our story ended up being about. Um, I think that you know it is really interesting, and I think that um, Anna Cavell, the local journalist or the the British journalist that we worked with, who was based in Kampala. Um, I know that she's done, like, there was a print piece that she published about um, a certain, um, it's been a while since I've read it, but I just remember that it was about um, a certain, you know, British man who was using the auspice of charities to go to Uganda and abuse children. Um, and it was this excellent investigation. Um, and it was, you know, a horrific story. And so I think that um, there's definitely a lot of work to do. Like, I think that there's a lot to still be talked about. Um, both in terms of you know exploitation and abuse and the way that this money, I mean, exploitation, ex exploitation of people donating as well. Like I'm, I'm interested in talking more about it, but it's not quite clear like how to do that just yet or what the story might be. We had talked um, yesterday um, about another film that was a longer film that was made in Uganda, um, came out in 2013, it's called God Loves Uganda. And it was made by Roger Ross Williams. Um, and that was a story of the um, in, intense homophobia in Uganda. And I guess that's uh, in, uh, seen in other African countries as well, and frankly, many parts of the world. Um, but in Uganda, it reached such a, a, an extreme that the government was actually debating um, uh, punishing homosexual behavior with the death penalty. Literally, people were, could, could have been sent sent to uh, execution for, for, for engaging in homosexual acts. Now, this film, um, and you guys, I, I think you've all seen it, showed the link between American evangelical Christian organizations and this political movement in Uganda. So there were these very conservative Christian organizations in the US who were acting as missionaries in Uganda and were pushing this anti-gay homophobic message which had got to the very top levels of government. Now the effect of that film was to so embarrass the Ugandan government that they actually reversed their policy. And so I would call that a win for documentary journalism, if you like. Um, and I guess um, 
the hope would be that what you have started here might also, uh, you know, you're not going to change the world entirely. And, and I understand that this, this orphanage business operates not just in Africa, but also you mentioned India, Nepal and so on. So it's a huge business, but, but that it might start some process where people say, you know what, <laughs> we got to clean this up too. Um, I don't know, if, if this is more longer term, but I don't know if you're optimistic there that you might have started something. I, I, I hope you have. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, well, first of all, just back to a previous question, your, your mention of God loves Uganda reminded me of it. A huge amount, I don't, I can't say for sure majority, but it seemed like to us of the orphanages who had partners internationally were sponsored by churches. Um, the U.S. evangelical movement in Uganda still is a huge foothold there. Um, I think you know, there are a lot of people in the Ugandan government and in the country who want this practice to end. Um, but, you know, as we witnessed, it's not as simple as changing a law because the laws now are much stricter yeah. um, in terms of regulating orphanages. It seems to us that it's more about, you know, enforcement and changing a culture of corruption, which again is in pretty much every country in the world. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to uproot a system that's so deeply ingrained in education in the way, you know, people, people there see white people as, you know, their best chance for, for getting out of poverty, even though, you know, it's clearly not the case. Uh, so I, I definitely am hopeful. Um, but I think there's just, it's going to take so much kind of, Joe, did you have something to say? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, this is one, one more thought on this, is that there actually is a movement already that, that we didn't start. I mean, there, in Uganda, there's a group of people that they call themselves alternative care, and it, it's many different sort of, um, you know, teachers and um, child care workers. Um, and it's, it's a big group that they're essentially trying to promote the idea that you know, a child doesn't need to find an orphanage or some kind of institutionalized care. What they need more so is family. Um, and so they're really strong advocates for, you know, taking, you know, actual orphans who actually don't have parents and placing them in other families or homestays or, you know, like situations where they actually get individual attention instead of being sort of in a, a group of 100 kids with two caregivers. Um, and I think that that's sort of, that's an interesting movement that's definitely, um, not getting the kind of support that you know some of these just orphanages do that that really do um, market like very sad looking children. Well, um, let me just um, wrap this up by saying that all the jurors for the David Kaplan Award loved your piece. It was really outstanding, you know, foreign um, journalism um, at its best. Um, I do think that it will have an effect. You know, you've mentioned some of the uh, organizations that are trying to change this and you're giving, you're gonna give them a lot of uh, extra uh, uh, support, I think, by doing this piece. Um, so congratulations, um, Joe, Julia, and Hint. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what your next projects will be. Um, and let me now hand it back to uh, Patricia from the Overseas Press Club. Um, yes, thank, thank you, uh, Terry and Hind and Julia and Joe. It was a really uh, fascinating conversation. And um, I too look forward to uh, your future stories. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.